The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. Hey everyone, happy to be with you here. So today we're going to do something a little different. I was thinking about just the topic of correcting children. And it's funny enough because it was coming up in my adult world, uh, specifically with my wife. So I find myself correcting her every now and again, you know, and we're talking about like some 30 something year old woman here, right? Uh, So say she leave some food out on the kitchen counter. I might be like, hey, you got to put that away. You know, ants could come, This, this kind of thing. Now, it didn't change anything, of course, and she wasn't too happy with me being a nag. Um, And in the same way, I'd find her correcting me at times, you know. Did you shut the light out in the bathroom, Jesse? You know, this kind of thing. Um, And of course, it didn't change my behavior none at all. So, and I know this happens all the time, whether it's in, you know, somebody else's house with relationship or in work with colleagues, this type of thing. Um, And then I thought, all this related to how I am with children. Like, I don't correct them like this. Uh, At least I try my best not to. And related, I also don't attempt to change their behavior with rewards or punishments. Um, So what I mean is, there's you know no giving treats to a child for doing something right or saying good job for something he or she did. Um, actually I have a whole episode on good job. So if you're interested in that, hop on over that afterwards. But on the, and then on the other end, you know, I don't do timeouts or comments like, you know, I told you not to do that. It's just something that I don't do. Um, and similarly, like many years ago, I completely stopped giving out points on assignments. Um, this is when I was doing elementary and junior high with working with children, um, or even grading them at all. Like I went from relatively traditional school teacher like that to none of that stuff. Um, Now, no grades, no points on assignments, this kind of thing. That is not the norm, of course. I mean, not even close. But in Montessori, it is. Or I should say, at least it's supposed to be, you know, with Montessori schools. Now, there are a million ways I could get into and talk about the Montessori method in this regard. Like, why we don't correct children, why we don't do rewards and punishments, um, as well as I'd get into maybe how it all works super well in practice. Like I could go on and on about this stuff. But what I thought I'd do today instead is just let the OG, the originator, speak for herself. I mean, as after all, Maria Montessori, she is the best spokesman or spokesperson, however you want to say that, I have ever heard on this subject. I mean, she just, she brings it. She brings the good stuff. Um, Not surprisingly, because she literally created the method. But so what makes today different is I'm just going to read directly from Montessori from it's a book of hers called The Absorbent Mind. Now, if you haven't read this, I cannot recommend it enough. Um, It's it's one of her most well-known books, if not the most well-known book. Um, But anyhow, what I'll do is I'm going to read a chapter in the book called Mistakes and Their Correction. And and get ready for it. I mean, I'm excited. It's man. Some of the some of the points just give me like goosebumps reading it. Um, but you know, some people struggle with Montessori's writing. So hopefully, I'm gonna make it you know approachable um, in the way I'll read it. Uh, but we will see. Now, quick note before I do start. Uh, this is somewhat for the academics out there, or if you're thinking of following along in the book, there are actually two editions of the Absorbent Mind. One is published back in 1949, and another, relatively more recently, 1988. I think that's still, you know, a few decades away. Um, But they're both based on lectures Montessori once gave. These are exciting lectures, so not, you know, kind of boring yap, yap, yap at you. And I'm going to be reading from both versions, as sometimes I think one is a little bit more clear or just more powerful, and then sometimes I think the other one is. So um, that's just a quick note. And I think that's all I really want to say in the beginning here. Uh, So let us hop in. I am going to be starting a couple of paragraphs into the chapter. uh, But other than that, here we go with Maria Montessori's own words. There is one thing the teacher must never do, and that is to interfere by praising a child's work 
or punishing him if it is wrong, or even by correcting his mistakes. This may sound absurd, and many people find it a stumbling block. How, they say, can we improve the child if we never correct his mistakes? Most teachers think it is their main business to correct, both in the moral and intellectual field, else the teacher does not feel she has done her job. The child's education has, they think, to be guided by two reigns, prizes and punishments. But if a child has to be rewarded or punished, it means he lacks the capacity to guide himself and that the teacher is hovering over the child and directing him. But supposing the child sets himself to work, then the addition of prizes and punishments is superfluous. They only offend the freedom of his spirit. Hence, in schools like ours, which are dedicated to the defense of spontaneity and which aim at setting the children free, prizes and punishments obviously have no place. Moreover, the child who freely finds his work shows that to him, they are completely unimportant. This is so difficult to understand that even in so-called Montessori schools, they are given. How often have I been invited to a prize-giving in such Montessori schools? Whereas if the children are given freedom, they are absolutely indifferent to prizes. In my first experiment with schools, the teacher, who was the caretaker's daughter, also had this idea of prizes and punishments. After all, it is so common in the home as well as in the school that it is almost incarnated in the soul of man. I was against it then, but had no method as yet, and I tolerated it because the poor teacher had to have something to do. She made a big military cross in gold or silver paper as rewards and pinned them to the breasts of the children rewarded with a silk ribbon. I did not think much of the idea, but I left it alone. One day I went to the school and found a child seated all by himself on a chair in the middle of the room and wearing a large cross. I asked, Have you given a prize to this one? The teacher said, No, he was being punished. That is why he is sitting alone. The cross had actually been given to another child, but it was getting in his way as he worked, so he gave it to the child in the middle of the room who had nothing to do and with whom it would not interfere and the child in the middle was indifferent both to the cross and to the punishment. We found also that sweets and such rewards were not appreciated. Prizes we might have abolished without serious protest. After all, this is economical. It affects few children, and then only once a year. So here Montessori is referring to those, um, those big end-of-the-year prizes for some students that end up you know, costing schools money. Um, anyways, here we go. But punishments... That is another story. These are given every day, and corrections are still more frequent. What does this correction, in exercise books, for example, mean? It means putting a mark A, B, or C, or 10, or 0. How can a 0 correct anyone's defects? Then the teacher says, You keep on making the same mistake. You don't listen to what I say. You will never pass your examinations like that. All these corrections in books and these accusations of the teacher only have a lowering effect on the child's energies and interests. To tell a child he is naughty or stupid just humiliates him. It offends and insults, but does not improve him. For if a child is to stop making mistakes, he must become more skillful. And how can he do this if, being already below standard, he is also discouraged? In olden times, teachers used to fasten donkey's ears to stupid children and smacked their fingers for writing badly. But even if they had wasted all the paper in the world to make donkey's ears, and if they had reduced the tiny fingers to pulp, this would not have brought any fresh powers into being. Only exercise and experience can correct a disability, and it takes long practice to acquire the various kinds of skills that are needed. The undisciplined child enters into discipline by working in the company of others, not by being told that he is naughty. If you tell a child that he lacks the ability to do something, he could quite as easily tell you, then why talk about it? I can see that for myself. This is not a correction. It is a statement of fact. Improvement and rectification can only come about when the child practices voluntarily for a long time. So I have to hop in here and say I've seen this contrast play out firsthand. Um, you know, in my early, more relatively traditional teaching days uh, before I got into really got into Montessori. So I used to mark up children's work with a lot of red pen. Um, 
And then we would have them do corrections on that work, which would occur over and over again. Like, I mean, I'm talking week after week, maybe sometimes month after month, some of these children would just continue to make the same mistakes. This is even after me just continuously, quote, correcting them with red pen. Um, But when I changed my approach, so I just had a mindset where I was just so much more comfortable with children making errors and mistakes as a natural part of learning and growing, um, they would always eventually correct themselves in the long run. And this was without my nagging. So at, at first, I was pretty amazed to see just how the quality of work improved so much when they were able to choose it and they weren't told, you have to fix this, you know? Um, but afterward, it was just so clear to me. It's like, what human being, young or old, enjoys te- somebody telling them, you must do this? And then on top of that, they're kind of hovering over their shoulder going, and you're not doing it exactly right. Like nobody enjoys that. Um, anyways, I just wanted to add that as a side note because I have to imagine some of you experienced that as children yourself, with somebody over your shoulder correcting you or the red, red ink everywhere. And then I just continue to do it. Like I had it as a kid and didn't like it. And then what did I do as a teacher? I just repeated what I had as a kid um, until... I was enlightened by Montessori and a few other thinkers as well. Anyways, okay, picking back up with Montessori, uh, where I'm going to jump back in, she is responding to a common concern that if we don't point out a child's mistake, then, well, the child might just continue to make it without even knowing he is making it. So to this, Montessori says, and I'm going to hop back into her own words now. True, it may happen that the child makes a mistake without knowing it, but also the teacher can err unconsciously. Unfortunately, Teachers usually have the idea that they must never make a mistake themselves for fear of setting a bad example. Hence, if the teacher does make a slip, she will certainly not admit it to the child. Her dignity rests on being always right. The teacher feels she has to be infallible. However, this is not entirely the fault of teachers. The whole school system is to blame, resting as it does on a false foundation. Supposing we study the phenomenon of error in itself, it becomes apparent that everyone makes mistakes. This is one of life's realities, and to admit it is already to have taken a great step forward. If we are to tread the narrow path of truth and keep our hold upon reality, we have to agree that all of us can err. Otherwise, we should all be perfect. So it is well to cultivate a friendly feeling towards error, to treat it as a companion inseparable from our lives as something having a purpose, which it truly has. Many errors correct themselves as we go through life. The tiny child starts toddling uncertainly on his feet, wobbles and falls, but ends up walking easily. He corrects his errors by growth and experience. We deceive ourselves if we imagine we are always following life's highway towards perfection. The truth is that we make mistake after mistake and do not correct ourselves. We fail to realize our faults, We live in a state of illusion shut off from reality. The teacher who poses as perfect and does not recognize that she makes mistakes is not a good teacher. Whichever way we look, a certain Mr. Error is always to be seen. If we seek perfection, we must pay attention to our defects, for it is only by correcting these that we can improve ourselves. We have to face them in the full light of day and realize their existence as something unavoidable throughout life. Okay, I'm going to stop here briefly to really highlight Montessori's words. Just repeating one line of hers. Quote, If we seek perfection, we must pay attention to our defects, for it is only by correcting these that we can improve ourselves. Okay, so think about that for a moment. Like, how much time do you spend trying to push away your defects? Like, when Montessori is saying we should be facing them in the full light of day, I mean, how often do we complain about children's issues where they're going wrong and how can we correct that when we haven't even faced our own issues? So I love how Montessori always brings it back to us, you know, to looking within. Like we cannot aid children in their growth if we ourselves are hiding or maybe even pushing away what makes our own growth possible. So Montessori is saying embrace the defects, the errors. It is the only way to get past them to genuine improvement. Okay, back to Montessori herself. Even in the exact sciences, 
mathematics, physics, chemistry, etc., errors play an important part because they have to be taken into account. The coming of positive science made it necessary to study the error scientifically. Science is only considered immune from error because it makes use of exact measurements to evaluate error. When measurements are made, there are two things that matter. One is to obtain a precise figure. The other is to know the extent to which it may be wrong. Whatever science has to say is stated as an approximation, never as an absolute, and this is allowed for in the conclusions drawn. For example, an antibiotic injection is found to be successful 95% of cases. But it is important to know there is this 5% element of uncertainty. Even a linear measurement is cited as correct only to a certain fraction of a unit. No figure is ever given or accepted without an indication of its probable error, and it is the calculation of this that makes it valuable. Probable errors are as important as the data themselves which are not taken seriously without them. If the evaluation of error is so important in the exact sciences, it is even more so in our work. For mistakes, to us, have a particular importance, and to correct or eliminate them, we have, first of all, to know them. So we come to a scientific principle which is also a path to perfection. We call it the control of error. Whatever is done in school, by teachers, children, or others, there are bound to be mistakes. So we need this rule as a part of school life. Namely, that what matters is not so much correction itself as that each individual should become aware of his own errors. Each should have a means of checking so that he can tell if he is right or not. I need to know whether I am doing well or badly. And if, at first, I treated my own mistakes as unimportant, I have now become interested in them. Children in schools of the usual kind often have no idea that they are making mistakes. They make them unconsciously and with complete indifference, because it is not their business to correct them, but the teachers. How far this is from our own idea of freedom. But, unless I can correct myself, I shall have to seek the help of someone else, who may not know any better than I do. How much better it is if I can recognize my own mistakes and then correct them, If anything is likely to make the character indecisive, is the inability to control matters without having to seek advice. This begets, or brings about, a discouraging sense of inferiority and a lack of confidence in oneself. What we know as a control of error is any kind of indicator which tells us whether we are going toward our goal or away from it. Supposing I want to go somewhere and I can drive a car, but I do not know the road. This happens often enough in daily life. In order to be sure that I go right, I take a map, and I also see signs en route that tell me where I am. I may have been seeing signs which said, two miles to Ahmadabad, but if then I suddenly see a sign that says, 50 miles to Bombay, I know I have gone wrong somewhere. The map and the signs have helped me. If I had had no map, I should have had to ask and be told many things contradictory in their advice. Reliable guidance and the possibility of checking as we go are the indispensable conditions for getting anywhere. So, what science and practical life both need must surely be accepted from the start as necessary in education. This is the possibility of recognizing one's own mistakes. We must prove this as well as instruction and materials on which to work. The power to make progress comes in large measure from having freedom and an assured path along which to go. But to this must also be added some way of knowing if, and when, we have left the path. If this principle be realized, both in school and in daily life, then it does not matter whether teachers and mothers are perfect or not. Errors made by an adult have a certain interest, and children sympathize with them, but in a wholly detached way. It becomes for them one of the natural aspects of life, and the fact that we can all make mistakes stirs a deep feeling of affection in their hearts. It is one more reason for union between mother and child. Mistakes bring us closer and make us better friends. Fraternity is born more easily on the road of error than on that of perfection. A perfect person is unable to change. If two perfect people are together, they invariably quarrel because neither can comprehend the other nor tolerate any differences. It will be remembered that one of our children's exercises is that with a set of cylinders of equal height but varying diameter which fit into the corresponding sockets in a block of wood. 
The first thing is to realize that all are different. The second is to hold them by the knob at the top of each, using the thumb and first two fingers. The child begins fitting them one at a time into their sockets, but finds when he comes to the end that he has made a mistake. One cylinder is left which is too large for the only remaining hole, while some of the others fit too loosely. The child looks again and studies them all more closely. He is now faced by a problem. There is that cylinder left over, which shows that he has made a mistake. Well, it is just this that adds interest to the game and makes him repeat it time after time. So this piece of apparatus meets two requirements. One, that of improving the child's perceptions, and two, that of providing him with a control of error. A quick side note here. When Montessori says apparatus, she is referring to what is more often today called materials in Montessori schools. So you can think of most of the physical work in Montessori classrooms, like the pink tower, the cylinder blocks Montessori is talking about, red rods, and on and on. Okay, continuing with Maria Montessori. Our apparatus is always designed to have this property of offering visible and tangible checks. A little one of two may start using it and quickly gets the idea of correcting his own mistakes. This sets his feet upon the path to perfection. By daily practice, he becomes sure of himself. But this does not mean he is perfect already, only that he acquires a sense of his abilities, and this bestirs in him the desire to try. If the child could express his thoughts fully, he might say, I am not perfect, I am not omnipotent, but this much I can do and I know it. I also know that I can make mistakes and correct myself, thus finding my way. So here we have prudence, certitude, and experience, a sure viaticum for the journey through life. Um, viaticum is a supply of goods. Um, I had to look it up myself. So Maria Montessori is saying this offers the child a sure supply of goods for the journey through life. Okay, continuing again with Montessori. To give this sense of security is not so simple as one might think, nor is it easy to set children upon a pathway towards perfection. To tell a person he is clever or clumsy, bright, stupid, good or bad, is a form of betrayal. The child must see for himself what he can do, and it is important to give him not only the means of education, but also to supply him with indicators which tell him his mistakes. Let us watch a somewhat older child who has been educated in this way. He works out sums in arithmetic, but is always shown how to check the answer, and this he forms a habit of doing. So instead of the teacher correcting, we let the child get into the habit of controlling his own errors. The checking often attracts him even more than the sum. The same thing happens in reading. In one exercise, the child puts cards with names on them besides corresponding objects. As a check, there is a card kept apart on which the same objects are pictured but with their names written beneath them. The child's greatest pleasure is to use this to see if he has made any mistakes. Okay, so to get a visual of this, you can imagine there's a little strip of writing that says hat on it, H-A-T. And then there's a picture of a hat, or you might even have a miniature hat, um, or even a real size hat in the classroom. So you would have the strip of paper, the child would match it with the object. And then there'd be this check over uh, next to it somewhere that would have an image of the object and the word hat connected all in one. So if the child wanted to check if he made the right uh, connection, he could just go to that one card and use it as a check. So he doesn't have to go to the teacher and say, teacher, teacher, did I do this right? You know, there's none of that in Montessori because the materials or the apparatus, they do that in themselves. The child can correct his own errors. Okay, hope, hopefully that was a little bit helpful. Back to Montessori. If in the daily routine of school, we always arrange for errors to become perceptible, this is to place us on a path to perfection. The child's interest in doing better and his own constant checking and testing are so important to him that his progress is assured. His very nature tends toward exactitude and the ways of obtaining it appeal to him. A little girl in one of our schools saw a reading command worded like this, go outside, close the door, and come back. She studied it intently and then started to carry it out but stopped mid-step and went to the teacher and said, Why did you write it like this? How can I come back if I have shut the door? Then the teacher said, You are quite right. It was my mistake. And she rewrote the sentence. Yes, the child said with a smile. Now I can do it. From all this awareness of mistakes, there springs up a kind of brotherhood. 
Errors divide men, but their correction is a means of union. It becomes a matter of general interest to correct errors wherever they may be found. The error itself becomes interesting. It becomes the link and is certainly a bond of harmony between children and adults. To detect some small error in a grown-up person does not produce lack of respect in the child or loss of dignity in the grown-up. The error becomes impersonal and is then amenable to control. In this way, small things lead to great. And that's the end of the chapter, everyone. And what lovely wording to close it, right? Like, in this way, small things lead to great. That's just so beautifully simple. Um, So if you want to read the chapter for yourself, again, it's called Mistakes and Their Correction. I'll be transcribing it on the podcast episode page so you can find it there. Um, But I highly recommend you just checking out the whole book that the chapter comes from. Again, The Absorbent Mind and by Maria Montessori, of course. So on the episode page, I'll also share links to both versions that I've been reading from. Um, Note that I don't really have a personal preference for one or the other. Um, Now, if you want to reach out to me, you know, share your thoughts on what Montessori had to say about corrections or anything else, really, I'd love to hear from you. You can write me over at MontessoriEducation.com or, you know, leave a comment wherever you are listening now. And if you enjoyed the Montessori Education podcast today with me, Jesse McCarthy, subscribe and like and share the show, um, all that good stuff. It's very much appreciated on my end. Okay, that is it. All my best to you all out there and adios for now.